there are at least three organisms, now four with mine, that cause Lyme disease. In the United States, um, before my study um, in 2013, we only knew that there was one cause of Lyme disease in the U.S., and that was Borrelia burgdorferi. And then they have a few other different types of uh, Borrelia that cause Lyme disease in Europe. But, um, yeah, uh, Mayo Medical Labs tests specimens from all around the United States and a lot of specimens from the upper Midwest. And it was June of 2013 that we detected an atypical PCR result that on further investigation we realized was a related species to Borrelia burgdorferi, but something that we had not seen before. And that's what we ended up describing as a new cause of Lyme disease in patients from the upper Midwest. Now, this is there's very specific differences, and one of the things I guess is kind of frightening to most people is that this doesn't manifest the same way as maybe uh, Bergdorferi does. Um, you don't necessarily get the bullseye rash, or do you not get it at all? We had one patient that did have the bullseye rash out of the four patients that had a rash. So first I'll say that we've only had six patients so far. So I think we have a lot mm -hmm. to learn still about uh, this new organism, which we're uh, tentatively calling Borrelia mayonii after Mayo Clinic. Um, mm -hmm. But so out of those six patients, four had a rash, and only one of them had a rash that was like that bullseye rash, the erythema migrans that we think of of Lyme disease. The other three had more diffuse rashes that were all over the body and really didn't have that targetoid or bullseye look. So, yeah, that's a, a little bit concerning. If that ends up being something that we see in all patients with this infection, um, only because doctors use that as a kind of a big important clue to uh, prompt testing or treatment for Lyme disease. What are the differences between Burdorferi yeah. and Mayoni? Am I saying that correctly? Mayoni. Mayoni. Yep, Mayoni. Mayoni. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> sure. Well, um, from the six patients that we've seen so far, there are some similarities, but there's also some differences. The similarities is that they did have um, a low-grade fever, headache, um, fatigue, myalgia. But what I think is interesting is four of our patients had nausea and vomiting. And that's not typically something we think of for Lyme disease and might actually prompt a physician to think more of like, oh, do they have a stomach bug? Do they get food poisoning? Um, so that's a little bit of a different symptom. And the other, I think, really important fact is that this was not a benign infection. In fact, um, several, several of our patients were hospitalized, and that's not something we typically think of um, with Lyme disease. Right. I mean, it's usually they get the fever. They, um, if they can have, get treatment, they don't normally get sent to the hospital at all. You know, they'll have a fever, they'll go to their doctor, maybe get treatment, maybe they'll just get over it, and then, mm -hmm. you know, the, the disease could progress. But people are actually going to the hospital for this. Is it yeah. deadly? I mean, it, is it, well, you, it's not should deadly it be considered from, deadly? Well, I guess potentially it could be deadly, although I would say that we did not um, – observe that. So we had two patients that were hospitalized, one for one day, one for four days. They did make a complete recovery. So that's the good news. Um, but you've probably seen in the literature and in the news that there have been people who have died of Lyme disease. So I suppose yeah. it's possible with this new organism, although we really, you know, don't know for now. Um, so definitely more to find yeah. out about this. And they did seem to respond yeah. to the typical antibiotics that we give for Lyme disease. So that's the good news is that if they get treatment, it does seem to work. Does it have to be early? I don't know if you need to do a lot yeah. more treatment to figure that out. But is it is it are you seeing that early treatment is more effective or is it just still too early to say? Well, I do think it's a bit early to say, but I would agree with you that the earlier you can treat patients, um, probably the better chance you have of clearing the organism rapidly and, and avoiding some of the late-stage complications that can occur after infection. Um, so we did have one patient who had arthritis, which you probably know is associated with Lyme disease, and um, that patient still had lingering symptoms for quite some time, even after they were treated. So you oh, definitely gosh. want to Similar, avoid those yeah. late stage complications by treating early. You actually have um, worked on trying to find better diagnostic treatments, uh, a diagnostic uh, procedures. Is that true? Is that something you're working on when it comes to tick diseases? 
Yeah, so I'm a pathologist and clinical microbiologist, so my focus is really in the laboratory, and um, we design and develop our own tests here at Mayo Clinic for tick-borne diseases with the idea of diagnosing them rapidly, like you said, so that patients can get treatment right away and hopefully avoid complications of uh, late diagnosis. What's the difference between what you've discovered as compared to what we currently have, this ELISA assay? Uh, we still use the ELISA assay with the immunoblot for most patients. Actually, uh, that's still the recommended treatment or recommended diagnostic modality. <clears throat> but we use another test in addition, um, which can be quite useful in some patients, and that's called PCR. And I don't know if you've heard of PCR before, but basically we're looking for the DNA, the genetic material of the Borrelia spirochete in patients' blood or their CSF or their synovial fluid. And that's how we detect it, Borrelia maonii. So while I wouldn't recommend PCR for everyone, it actually does seem to be the method of choice for diagnosing Borrelia maonii. Is this um, available for most people? Well, usually a patient would go to their doctor, and if their doctor worked with Mayo Medical Laboratories, like I said, we're a, an international reference lab, so we have a lot of people, a lot of doctors that work with us, then they could send their specimen to us. Um, a lot of doctors already have that arrangement through their own local laboratory, so um, it's easy to do. Uh, and I'm guessing as more people go on, there will be other laboratories offering this test as well. Uh, it just so happened that we were very fortunate that we had this test available, and we do offer it then uh, for people who uh, are whose physicians suspect they have infection. Do you have to have a positive test before your test can be sent off for a, for a PCR test? We recommend always using serology in conjunction with PCR, um, but it, <clears throat> no, it depends on how early you catch it. So in the first day or two, you may not have serology, uh, a positive serology result because the body just hasn't formed antibodies yet. But usually the patient in 70 to 80 percent of the cases with normal Borrelia burgdorferi infection, they have that bullseye rash. And if you have the bullseye rash, you don't need testing at all. That's just treat it. Um, so that's actually a good thing because serology is probably going to be negative in those first couple of days. Um, but if you're in a situation like we are with Borrelia maonii infection, you might not have that typical bullseye rash. And therefore, physicians may not know to treat for Lyme disease. And if they do serologic testing, it may be negative if it's still the first day or two. So I think that's the spot where PCR is very useful, in that early stage of disease before serology turns positive. But yet a patient so, and doesn't have a bullseye rash. I do want to um, mention, though, that what we've discovered looks like it is geographically restricted to the upper Midwest. Um, because we've tested patient specimens from all around the United States, in fact, um, we've tested over 100,000 specimens uh, since November of 2003 when we first started offering this test. And mm -hmm. we've only found six patients uh, they were only detected from 2012 to 2014, so it looks like it might be a newly emergent infection. And all of the patients, this is really interesting to me, um, had exposure to ticks in Minnesota or Wisconsin. We tested during that same two-year time frame almost 25,000 specimens from, all, from 44 other states. We didn't get any of those Borrelia maonii positives. That's good to know. That is, is. reassuring, at least. I mean, it's, it's terrible for the people in that area, but um, it is yeah. good to know for everyone who might be concerned that it might be, like, in, you know, all right, of the United all States. Over. That's not the yeah, case. so I don't right. want to give the message that everyone needs to run out and get tested by PCR for Borrelia maonii, because unless they're in mm -hmm. the upper Midwest, it's probably not really um, important for them. But in terms of the, the Borrelia, the new one that you just found, do you have any reason to believe that it might just be a mutation from the original, or is it a completely different disease in itself? Well, it's obviously a different organism. It may have, you know, tens of thousands of years ago uh, arisen from a mutation uh, from another Borrelia species, but we, you know, that I can't comment on. But I can definitely say that from all the testing we've done, we can show it's definitively a new organism separate from Borrelia burgdorferi. So we tested uh, 
over 600 Ixodes scapularis, and we had about 3% of those that were positive. Those are just ones that we collected in Wisconsin. So um, they were positive when we tested them by PCR for the DNA of Borrelia maonii. So mm -hmm. I guess the bottom line is we are finding Borrelia maonii in Ixodes scapularis in Wisconsin, very close to where some of our patients probably got infection. So we think it's the same tick. Um, and we've also done studies, uh, actually the CDC folks there did studies to show that the tick is capable of transmitting Borrelia maonii to uh, rodent models. So I think it's safe to say that it's the same tick. And interestingly, we had some ticks that were infected with both Borrelia maonii and Borrelia burgdorferi. So you could yeah. potentially get both from a single tick bite. So I always emphasize protective measures because, I mean, I think it's really fascinating, um, important to know that we found this new organism, but I think it just really drives home the point that folks need to know that ticks transmit really serious, uh, well, agents that can cause really serious infections and they need to protect themselves against ticks. I mean, I think sure. the day of just going out and walking through the woods without thinking about checking yourself for ticks or protecting yourself from ticks is just gone. I don't think people can you know, safely do that anymore. No, that's so true. And now, in, and also in terms of informing um, physicians these days, because it's yeah. very difficult um, to, uh, for some reason, it's very difficult for some doctors to acknowledge that even um, Borrelia burgdorferi exists or that the treatment needs to begin immediately or without mm -hmm. um, seeing that bullseye rash. Now we're throwing into the mix that there's a whole nother species that doesn't yeah. even necessarily manifest with a bullseye rash. So that's right. a whole other wrench into this mess. Mm -hmm. It does. And I think that's probably one of my main take-home messages is that at least from the limited data we have so far, you, you can't count on that bullseye rash to think that a patient has Lyme disease if it's due to Borrelia maonii. And um, during that early stage, serology won't necessarily be positive. Again, gotcha. this is, you know, patients in the upper Midwest where this exists. Sure, exactly. Well, they're, they're running into the very same situation with just um, Burdorferi, to be honest. I mean, they well, still have yeah. that problem with the, the um, early stage testing for, um, mm -hmm. for Lyme disease the Lyme disease we know and obviously right. do not love. <laughs> right. So, no, it's true. Um, yeah, that for that 20 to 30 percent that don't have the bullseye rash with just normal Lyme disease, during, you know, due to Borrelia burgdorferi, serology is usually positive in the first couple of days. So, yeah, I, I think we need better tests. What we have work okay, but I think that uh, we need to raise physician awareness and, and keep working on better tests. Agreed. Um, so what's being done for the folks out there in the Midwest? Is there like an awareness ca campaign going? Do you know of that? I know you're working in the lab, but do you know if it's trying to notify folks in the area that this kind of disease is being transmitted by ticks? Yeah, we've done a lot um, so far, and we continue to do a lot. Um, I've been working with the Minnesota Department of Health and the Wisconsin Department of Health, and they've done a lot of education for their local physicians. I've given numerous talks, probably, oh, I don't know, 15 talks in the past year just on this topic alone, and I'm scheduled for many, many more. Of course, um, we've issued through Mayo Clinic press releases. The CDC has a Q&A page, and they issued a press release. So we're doing what we can to get the information out there. Um, you know, it's always a struggle to reach all the physicians. Oh, yeah. I hear yeah. you. <laughs> now, but in terms of, the, it's just such a wide spectrum of symptoms that people mm -hmm. suffer from. Um, like you said, like this nausea is new. Um, the, oh, you say it was nausea and something else. Nausea and vomiting. No, nope, vomiting. vomiting. Right. Yeah, nausea and vomiting. Yeah. Right. I mean, you could so, see it sometimes in normal Lyme disease, but it's just not something that we think of as a common symptom. And yet, sure. the majority of our patients had it. Do you think it's difficult for a doctor to digest that they should immediately think, well, this could be Lyme because there's so many different common symptoms that come with so many common diseases? I think it can be, especially for physicians who maybe aren't as used to seeing it. I think that our primary care physicians who see patients that are in really high endemic areas for Lyme, I'm guessing that they're a lot more aware of it versus the people that might be in the lower 
endemic areas, so there's not as much disease, and maybe they don't see it as often. If you oh, actually gotcha. go okay. to the Minnesota Department of Health website, they have all the different counties um, mm. with a map of where your greatest risk of getting a tick-borne illness is. So um, ticks like moisture, uh, forested areas. So if you're downtown in Minneapolis, you're probably not at risk, whereas if you're out in the woods, you know, in the middle of the state, you probably could be at very high risk of getting bitten by a tick. Some some kind of suburban and rural areas, people could get exposed in their backyard just out doing yard work. So at the very least, they need to be checking themselves for ticks when they come back in. I would say that they should take measures before they even go outside, like spraying DEET on exposed skin and spraying something like permethrin on their clothing. I think that um, it's just important to say that, you know, we're still learning about new tick-borne illnesses, bourbon virus and uh, heartland virus. They're probably Are they new? Uh, they're relatively new. They've both been described in the past, like, two to three years, four years or so. Um, mm -hmm. Heartland, as you can imagine, is in the so-called heartland area of the U.S., yeah. you know, so it's a little bit south of the Midwest, more like the central U.S. Um, right, right. And, of course, we've discovered Powassan virus, deer tick virus, Borrelia miyamotoi. So I think that there's definitely a need for more people interested in studying these organisms and and studying what can infect humans and cause disease. I think not all physicians have had the same level of awareness of tick-borne illnesses, but I would also say that the prevalence, the, the rate of people getting infected by tick-borne diseases has increased. And that's probably due to a lot of different factors, including just expansion of the range of the ticks themselves. And also, I think we as humans are changing how we interact with nature. We're going out more into wooded areas, maybe not farming as much. And so there's more um, just trees and wooded areas that can support the whole life cycle of the tick. So there's, right. it's probably very multifactorial, but tick-borne diseases are increasing in number. So it isn't just that we haven't been noticing it as much. It's not that the science hasn't caught up. It's just that, with, like with urban sprawl and people being more outdoorsy, you're yep. seeing more people getting infected. Exactly. Right. So it's a combination of that. And then, of course, as more and more tick-borne illnesses are discovered and more people are getting sick from these, more and more people are getting interested in doing studies on these organisms, finding out more yeah. about them. Now, in terms of that, and I promise this is my last question, do you feel like your your division or where you worked in um, not just the Mayo Clinic, but maybe just in your in your experience, that um, you personally have seen an uptick? I mean, pardon that pun, but that in the amount of people who are now working on um, lab or clinical uh, mm -hmm. exploration of tick-borne disease, I would have you say seen yes. that or experienced it yourself? I have, especially in the upper Midwest, because we're an area that's endemic for Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and numerous other tick-borne illnesses, um, I think we're increasingly aware and interest, aware of these organisms and interested in studying them. But mm -hmm. I think also world, well, worldwide, but definitely across the United States, I've heard, I would say the, that there's an increasing interest in studying tick-borne diseases. Mm -hmm.